Okay, well it's good to see so many of you and it's good to be back here again. I've missed a few, so it's good to be back. Um, as you can see, I'm going to be talking about honeypots. Uh, Glenn has already suggested an alternative name, which we're not going with due to children in the audience. <laughs> so I'm going to look at some research that I did recently around what honeypots are and the sort of things I was finding popping up in the honeypots I've been running. This terminal in the top right is actually a live connection to the management side of the honeypot. So anything that pops up there is live, somebody touching the honeypot and trying to do bits and pieces. We'll be able to see the sort of things they're doing. So what's a honeypot? It is not anything to do with our lovely bear-like friend here, but as soon as I mentioned to a friend of mine I was talking about honeypots, she said, oh, you've got to have a picture of Winnie the Pooh. So there it is. A honeypot is actually a system that has no legitimate traffic. So anything that touches it, we know is bad. So it looks attractive, hence the name, Glen. there you go, honey, attractive. Looks attractive, means that people might want to go and have an explore, perhaps they're hoping they're gonna find something. So you might call the honeypot finance server, for example. And as I said, there's no legitimate traffic. So anything that's touching it, we know is somebody up to no good. And we can use these either for academic purposes, which is what I've been doing, or you can put them in your live environment so that if somebody perhaps does a port scan and finds the honeypot, an alarm will go off, you'll get an alert saying, somebody has gone and touched this thing, you might want to do something about that. They're quite handy if you put them in the environment and then somebody else starts running a vulnerability scan across your entire subnet, because you'll get an alert and then you can go, excuse me, why are you doing that? And I did have that at one place where we hadn't excluded the honeypot and my boss got quite panicky as all of a sudden he started getting emails saying somebody was having a go. So as I say, I'm looking at the academic side. So everything that we're looking at, we can tra tra trash it, we can do whatever we like. So we might get connections from different types of people. We've got the curious ones and they might be legitimate users. So perhaps people within our organisation who are just having a nose around. And I don't know about you, but certainly I've been on networks and I've gone, I wonder what's over there, and I've had a look. I haven't ever found a finance server in that, that way. But equally, you might have some curious illegitimate users, people that aren't part of your organisation and are just having a nose around anyway. So they might find a honeypot on the internet, like this one, and have a look at that. The more concerning are the malicious people. So your malicious legitimate users, they're your insider threat people who might want to do the organisation harm even though they're employed by it. Obviously they're quite a risk because they've already got higher access than somebody that isn't part of the organisation. So we want to know about them as soon as possible. Equally, your malicious, illegitimate users, those that have nothing to do with you, they're out on the internet, they've found your stuff, they're giving it a go to see what they can do. So we've got different types. We can have a pure honeypot, which might literally just be a stood up copy of an operating system, maybe a Windows server, maybe a Debian box, and that's a full environment. Whatever you would be able to do if you install it on your own laptop, you'll be able to do in a pure honeypot. Then you've got your low interaction, and they literally just pretend to be something. So it might be that you've got a honeypot that pretends to be an email server, and it will say, hello, I'm listening on port 25 for SMTP, and then something will come along and say, hello, port 25, I want to do something. And it will just stop at that point, because it's not got the brains to do anything bigger. It's not programmed to do that. Or you've got medium to high interaction, where you can do a bit more, but not as much as with a pure honeypot. And that's what I've been using. So the environment that we can see the log for there will allow you to do all sorts of different things. You can't go and run every bit of code that you could download off the internet you could pull down additional code. If it's a script, it will run. If it's an executable, it will die. You can do bits and pieces like that. It's more complete, you can do more with it, so it's good for our purposes as, for academic research, but it's not gonna give you the full scope. So this setup here, this is a VM running in, the, in uh, Microsoft Azure, simply because I have a 365 tenant, so I put it over there. Equally, you could put it in DigitalOcean, AWS, doesn't matter as long as you can run your virtual machine, you could host a honeypot there. And I'm using an open source project called Cowry. And Cowry will provide you a Telnet or an SSH honeypot, and it's got various plugins to allow it to log to file, log to a database, and do bits and pieces. So for my setup, I've said it's SSH only, and 
port 22 is your standard SSH port. So there's a little bit of forwarding that is going on so that people can get in on port 22. Nothing else is listening from the honey pot side. There's no telnet, it's just SSH. It gives us a nice text shut. Management traffic, so how I'm connected here, that's on a different port because normally SSH is 22. If your honey pot's 22, your management SSH can also be 22. So I've moved that. I have in the past forgotten that I've moved it and then probably connected into my own honey pot and sat there going, why can't I log in? Oh dear, my system's been hacked. No, <laughs> I just forgot, I've moved it. Fortunately, I didn't forget this time. And in this setup, the only permitted username is root. And as I'll show in some of the, the research later, all sorts of usernames got tried, but this is the only one that worked. If while you're sitting there, you fancy having a go, that is the address that you can SSH to, honey.johnstocks.org.uk. Feel free, just bear in mind, anything you do will come up in that window there, so be nice. <coughs> so this honeypot was running for about a week before we're here this evening. So the research that I'm looking at was written up on Sunday. I've no idea how I'm doing for time, by the way, Alex, so you might turn out. The first attacker arrived within 11 minutes. So that was after I'd done my testing, after somebody else had done some testing for me. 11 minutes, first malicious person appeared and started doing bits and pieces. Which is fairly incredible given how big the internet is. And people will be scanning for this when they come into how you actually arrive at them in a bit. So by Sunday the 9th, there we go, somebody's arrived. By Sunday the 9th, there were 65 unique attacking IP addresses. So addresses on the internet that had touched the honeypot. That's not to say that there were only 65 attempts at doing things. Some of the AIPs almost certainly came back. I haven't dug that far into the data yet, but they certainly arrived. And of the usernames that tried to connect, 69 usernames were in there. And you had everything from admin to administrator to admin2, to Postgres, to Tomcat, all sorts of different bits and pieces, including my own name, which was a bit confusing because <laughs> I definitely didn't do it. And then there were 105 different passwords that actually attempted to log in. Obviously, if you used one of those with root as the username, you're in, no problem. Other stuff didn't happen. And those passwords were quite a standard selection. You had blank as an option, for example. The word password and variants thereof, so capital P's, at symbols, fives. There were strings of numbers, everything from just a single number one all the way up to one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight. Oh, somebody else. And various variants on that theme, including interestingly Raspberry, which if you've ever sat on a Raspberry Pi, the default password for the user account called Pi is Raspberry. So obviously someone was trying that up with that. There were 17 unique commands that were run. Some of those commands actually were just a reordering of something that had already happened. And they always will see that there was a common theme for what the attackers were trying to do this time. Of the countries that touched, we had all sorts of things. China was the top ranking, which wasn't necessarily a surprise. Followed by USA, was a bit of a surprise, but there's lots of people in the USA, so not a huge shock there. Republic of Korea, Germany, and then it tails off. Not very many from GB. We were quite low down. I think that was three for us, which was a bit of a surprise. Interestingly, Russia is down at another two, I think that is. Um, I guess they're a bit busy at the moment. But I was expecting to see them much higher up the list. And China had a continuous range. So when I'm looking at the addresses, the ones from China are just numerically going up by one each time. Interestingly, they skipped 18. 15, 16, 19, so, skipped so they had a continuous range. But it's important to remember, of course, that it's possible that actually the, the attacker, or whoever is controlling the script, is more likely attacking this may not be in those countries. That's just where the address that touched me came from. So the motivation. When so I did this research... Just going back to that. Um, there's a program called The Lazarus Heist, um, a podcast, a really good podcast. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff White, um, he's been tracking this North Korean hacking group, group called Lazarus. Um, they're responsible for uh, things like wanna cry. But they actually have operatives working in China because North Korea, there's only about 300 people in the whole country with internet access. So what they do is they send operatives out to China, sometimes Russia as well, they're on the border of North Korea, but mostly in China, so they're actually sitting just a few miles inside the border in China, which may be the reason why China is getting yep. 
because it's an industry and China is is a good target for them to, to work, good mm -hmm. base for them to work with. So that could be the Yeah, best. absolutely. If you've not seen the Lazarus Heist podcast, it's on BBC Sounds, I think. Jeff White's the investigative journalist. He's actually really quite interesting. He does a lot of good work. He's got a couple of books out, one of which is The Lazarus Heist itself. The other one is something like Hacking.com, isn't it? I can't remember. It's called Hacking.com. It is called Hacking.com, yeah. uh, which is a really good read, and it's not too technical. So if you're thinking, oh, I might go and have a read of that, but it will be scary technical, it isn't. It's actually quite accessible. So as I say, when I did this research a year ago, or did the same research a year ago, everything was financial gain motivation. Everything that attacked the Honeypot was trying to install a crypto miner, it was trying to mine Monero at my expense. Because the way that crypto mining works is you go and run a load of processing intensive code, and at the end of it, you get some form of financial reward. So if you can get someone else to pay for it, it's pure profit for you. So that was my last year. This year, there was only one obvious miner. Everything else was entirely different. And looking at the names, some of the commands that were running had the word brute in them, suggesting some form of attack or brute force. But we'll come on to exactly how that worked in a moment. So to find it, so before they can use me, they'll find it, they might scan the internet, scan a whole set of ports, probably focusing on 22. They'll find something is listening on 22, and then they'll try and log in. Almost certainly, particularly looking at the patterns, it's not a human sat there doing this. They will just run a script, it will come back and say these addresses are available for you, and then their script will just log in and do whatever it wants to do. So once they've logged in, they run a command that will install the necessary tools. And it was quite noticeable that all of their commands were on one line, just separated by semicolons. So they could literally put it in a script that just SSH is over, runs it, they can forget about it, it will set up and do its own thing. Once they've downloaded their tools, they run the scripts for it, and then they're going to profit one way or another, either the cryptocurrency mining or by having another machine under their control, which is what they were doing this time. So here's an example of log entry. And you can see I've blacked out some of the uh, parts of the IP address, because you don't want to go there, because you will end up with a script that you can download and run. And what's interesting here is that the attacker hasn't done anything to find out what kind of system it is they have arrived at. They're assuming it's Linux, which is not a bad suggestion given it's running SSH. And their first command is yum install wget y which essentially says, if you're a Red Hat machine or similar, go and install the tool called wget, and the minus y just means don't ask me, literally just, just do it, carry on. And then the next command is apt install wget y which is the same thing but for a Debian based operating system. So in Debian itself, Ubuntu, in my case, this is running on Debian. So the first command would just fail, at which point it doesn't matter. It just moves on and tries the second one. And similarly, if the first command had succeeded and it moved on to the second one, that would fail, it doesn't matter. Then the attacker moved into the temp directory, it's probably a good place to have some form of writable storage. And then they used wget, which they have installed. And they point at a web address and they say, basically, download x86.sh, which is a script. What I found really bizarre is they then try the same thing with curl, but they haven't installed. So there's no guarantee that curl is here. If we'll get failed, we'll try curl as well. Really, they could have just put curl after we'll get up here, and then they had two chances of perhaps getting something. But hey, quick and dirty, I suppose. We've then got shimod 777x86.sh. Now, for those familiar with Linux type file systems, instead of having, like in Windows, a nice list where you can say this user can do this, and this group can do that, you have every file owned by a person, owned by a group, and then the world. And the permissions give you a number. So 777 means that every user on the machine, every group on the machine, sorry, the user that owns it, the group that owns it, and then everything on the machine has full permissions on it. They can read it, they can write it, and they can execute it. And that gives you the set. Because on Linux, by default, just because you've downloaded a machine, it could be an executable, it wouldn't matter, 
the notice isn't going to let you run that by default. You actually have to change the permissions and say you may run this. So once they've made it so they can run their script, they then say sh, which is a shell, x86.sh, Microsoft. Now if you're going to put sh in the beginning, you don't need to trim it first, because it will just pass it in. But never mind, they've done bad stuff with curl, they're just going to do it here as well. So they then try and run their script. I never found out what the point of having the word Microsoft was in there, because the script doesn't look at an argument. It's got no interest at all. <laughs> Some of them said brute instead. I think there was also one that said Spotify. So it's totally pointless. It's the same script in each case, but never uses that bit. So if we take the script and it downloads, it looks like this. So this is the x86.sh. So at the top we've got binaries, and you'll notice, ooh, 10 minutes, thank you, mate. You'll notice that binaries is spelt wrong. <laughs> right? In English, that would end R I E S. So possibly, whoever put this together is not a native speaker. Possibly they are and they're trying to pull this off the set. So we've got a list of possible uh, processor architectures in there. And then we've got the server IP, which is the same as where they got the script from. And they've got some code that basically says for each of these things inside binaries, Delete a copy if you've already got it. Use WGET, which must be here, presumably, unless we use GIRL. Go and download that file. But don't worry, if WGET fails, we'll use GIRL. <laughs> and if GIRL fails, we'll use TFTP. And if that one fails, we'll try a different way of using TFTP. <laughs> one size doesn't fit all, I suppose. And then they go and shim on to 777. But this time they needed to, because this time they're saying, and now execute it. So they're executing the code, which is that dollar arch, and then they're saying root.x86, which is an argument. Now that one actually did download an executable rather than a script, so I stopped at that point. But it will go off and it will do whatever with that file. It will then clean up after itself and stop. Great. So what is the file it downloaded? Well, if you throw it into virus total, which is a really useful tool that you can upload a file to, it will then scan it with different antivirus providers. You find out that this one is Mirai, which is a botnet. So what this attacker was trying to do was enrol the honeypot into the Mirai botnet so they could then use it to attack something else. And Mirai will run on all sorts of things. You can run it on routers. A Microtik had a vulnerability a while ago where a Microtik router would go and run the Mirai botnet. Draytech, I believe, had a similar. So it's quite flexible in that regard. Another log entry. I won't go all the way through it, it's very, very similar. And that actual script that we start with is in fact a downloader. So it's going to go and pull something else in. And this script, which is one I found really quite bizarre, just goes and runs that. That's the whole script, it's just on one line. But inside the script there's multiple lines with different processor architectures in the middle. They're not even trying just a small list, they're just literally hammering the same code every time, but just changing this bit at the end. Now what I found funny, my background many years ago, I used to be really into Amigas. Do you remember the Commodore Amiga? The processor architecture for Commodore Amiga was M68K, it was the Motorola 68000 series processor. Somebody is hoping that somewhere <laughs> there is an operating system using the Motorola 68000 series processor, which probably hasn't been manufactured in decades, that they can then use to enrol in Mirai, because this actually is, again, Mirai that it's gone and downloaded. But sure, if you want to try and run that on somebody's Amiga or their app, uh, what is it, Acorn or similar, oh, Acorn is risk, isn't it? What was that one? Sorry? 6502 and BBC. Yeah, so look at the BBC, yeah. Another one that was common at the same time as the Amiga, I forgot, Atari, there you go, 686. You can try and run your Mirai botnet on that. It'll be really high powered at a whole less than 20 megahertz a second. So the thing that I'll do, assuming the demo gods are smiling, is we'll connect in to the honeypot. So that's obviously the management side. Let's get another shell. So here we go. I'm just going to remote in. So root at honey.johnstocks.org.uk. Asking for a password, we just smash that keyboard. So there we go, and it looks like we're in a debian environment. And we can 
I'm not going to be able to do this anyway. You name dash AR. So here we go. We get told it's running version 3.2 of the Linux kernel, which is pretty old now. We can see that the machine is probably called Code Harbor. We run the host name, assuming the Honeypot supports it. Yep, we get told it's Code Harbor. So that's great. And we can do much like the attacker did. And you're all watching, so the chance of me typing correctly is going to be tiny. We can go and get. Oh, yeah. yes, Ooh, that's gone wrong. Audience participation. You need to spot all the typos. I'm so anxious for you. Uh, I'm also using two different keyboard layouts, which makes it fun. There we go. So it went and got a file, which should be my website. And we can see, yeah, it's there. So I think, all right, let's. Let's view it in less, and it's going to say, no, command less not found, so fine, we'll cat it instead. And cat is on there, so we can do that. So we could go and do all sorts of things, and if we wanted to, we logged in as root, we could just say, power off. And say, no, you need shutdown, it's not all fine, you know what, can't do all that, I'm going to say reboot. And so go down for reboot now, <coughs> and it's cut me off. So all right, fine. We'll, uh, we'll go back in and um, different set of mash keys. That rebooted really quick, even for a Debian box. Well, how long has it been up? Eight days, apparently. That's reassuring because when I did this prep work three days ago, it said five days, so at least that counter is ticking along quite happily. <laughs> but it definitely hasn't been up eight days if this was a real machine, because I just told it to reboot. And there's a few other things we can do in there. We could snoop around, we could have a look at the file system. So that's the top of the file system. And uh, we've got test2 in there. So let's see what test2 is. It's just a file. Or it contains test2 itself. So let's just go back and get a longer form of that. Yeah, it's just a file. It's owned by root. Not going to be interesting, I suspect. Let's have a look. So it's, it's some form of binary. So it's some form of executable. Okay, fine. What else have we got? We've got SRV. There's a useful tool on Linux called Steam Locomotive for every time you type SL rather than LS, and it puts an ASCII <laughs> Steam train coming across. So SRV, it's empty, you can't do in there. Well, we can snoop around and we can see what's going on. And if you dig into the carry honeypot a bit more, you'll see that in theory there's a user called fill on there. If you look in the home area, there isn't a fill. There's a fret. And the fingerprints are quite known for carry. So it wouldn't be difficult for an attacker to work out, ha ha, I'm in a carry honeypot, I'm going to stop now. But as we've seen, they don't. Because to them, there's no point. They just want a quick win. So they connect, they run their commands, that's it, move on. It's a quick win for them. If it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. There's plenty of other things out there, and they're not all going to be honeypots. So I think that was a useful demo. I'm amazed it worked, but that's always good news. I'm good for questions if you are. I have many questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, they're probably really stupid questions, though, so I do apologise. That's right. Um, Okay, so this is really, this is very, very stupid. You mentioned really early on when you were talking about um, different user names that people try. Yep. You said one was called Postgres? Postgres. So Postgres is a database. Yeah, why is that a username? I know it's not completely relevant, but it just really confuses me because I know that's a database. In some configurations of system, oh. Postgres will run under a user account called Postgres. Got it, thank you. So this Cowrie is actually running under a user called Cowrie. Oh. Well, I could have set it up to run under a user account. Okay. Okay, sorry, like I said, not really like so low level compared to what you've been doing, but it's just bugging me. Uh, I've got so many questions. Oh, let Chris have wait. <laughs> no, he sponsored. No, you sponsored. You, 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 you beat me. <laughs> um, I'm just, I was just thinking earlier where you said there was that random argument at the end that didn't actually mean anything. I can't remember. When you run top or H top, does it show you the arguments? I'm wondering if that's a bit of a decoy. So you yeah, know, what's be. this random script running? And it would look like Microsoft. Microsoft yeah. or Spotify, or I'm just wondering if that was it's a good like thought. a decoy. You know, if you do anything. Are you about to say that's not how it works? No, I was thinking it's likely 
but that initial script is a generic injector of payloads. And so they're just running what they always run, and what it fetches next could well be a script that has a trigger for Microsoft. Or oh, it sees it through to the next command. Yeah, and whatever it decides to take could be anything. It, they, could, they could vary it depending on what they're doing that day. Yes, could be. Any others? Go for it. Did you see any evidence of client sides which have got things wrong? So, i.e. clients which thought they were connecting to an old Azure instance where you've got the IP address for it now, or clients um, where there was perhaps bit rot and it was just contacting the wrong IP address? No. <laughs> Sadly not. That would have been quite interesting. And I have had in the past somebody contacted me to do a vulnerability disclosure because an IP that I did have somebody else had got, and that was chock full of issues. And I could turn around and say no, but on this one, no, I didn't see anybody else in there, sadly. Uh, this is really quite fascinating. <laughs> yeah. uh, really interesting, thank you. For, for your new IP pals that have dropped by, would it be the case that you put to blacklist those IPs from everything, and then and that only part stays open for? Yeah, I could do. What does that um, there are various programs, so in Linux, for example, you've got something like fail to ban, and I could hook something in to say, if you go and find the IP in the honeypot log, then ban them, so yes you could, and then see what other people got. Um, so I was talking to somebody at a conference the last three days, one of the things they said was try deploying in a different geography. So this was deployed in the UK region, it's in the UK south for Azure. He said try and deploy one in Germany and compare your results. He said, because what you're probably going to find, because he does a similar bit of research, what you're going to find in the UK is you're just going to get chopped for the script kiddies and that's it. He said, go and chuck one into Germany and see what you get there, because his honeypots get fewer script kiddies. So, not necessarily answering your question, but possibly relating that you know, different things will happen. Yeah. Chris, I have another question, yeah. Um, I think I might have gone out to pay at the time, but with, with Carrot, is it, do you only, can you only access information about who's hitting your honeypot through the log, or are there options for, like, hooks or callbacks you can ping other services on other systems to notify that there's a nefarious user in the neighbourhood type of thing. I haven't configured it to do so, but Carrie's got plugins that can do things like that, so it will go and throw them through GOIP block lists and similar and see, you know, was this a known attacker or it can link into Splunk and things like that. So in theory, yeah, especially if you want that list yeah. coming in. Yeah, in theory, you can just extend it and bolt it on something. Yeah. Cool. You're good. Um, when you showed the graphs earlier of the regions that the attacks came from, do you know if those regions represent the attackers or other victims? I can't know that. Well, all that tells you is that the machine that did it had an ID. The racing machine that it, it ended at is there. Is there? It could be like a Tor exit node or something like that. Yeah. So unfortunately I can't work out were they another victim, because it could be the mirror I bought there just expanding itself. Yeah. Mm. I can't, there's, there's no way for me to know, short of finding out who owns the IP and saying, hi, did you know? It's a shame you can't retry the username and password back on their server. <laughs> that would be illegal, but it would yeah. be fascinating. <laughs> 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 Still illegal, Sam. Yeah. This is also recorded. <laughs> Going back to what I said earlier, um, Jeff White has done a lot of research into this as well, and uh, he actually found a hotel in China where pretty much all the IP addresses pointed to this one hotel, and they called it Hackers Hotel, I don't know if you heard of that, yeah? They called it Hackers Hotel because that's where all the hackers stay. Was that in Marriott? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Out of curiosity, was there a correlation between region and the type of password and, and username input? I haven't looked at the data in that detail, but it's not a bad shout. I might have a look and then blog about it later. So there you go. Shame Second talk. Go. Second talk, maybe, yeah. Um, so I haven't looked is the honest answer. But there was nothing, well, there was one password that was not English and everything else was in English or a number set, so. I suspect they used um, downloaded 
combinations of password usernames on your rainbow tables as well. <coughs> Some of them will. So you might just find out like, which target is most like is it Cisco systems or Jupyter or So there were no Cisco's tried, and the default for Cisco would be Cisco's username, Cisco's password, or at least it used to be. Um, sadly they were too generic to be specific to a, a default cred beyond your standard admin admins. So it's a nice thought, but apparently they're not interested. I need the text to be a little bit more interesting for a second one, Alex. <laughs> One of them was your username. One of them was my name. I'm mm -hmm. not the only person on the planet to have it. No, that's what I was wondering. Is it just because you've got a common name? I wonder. If one of them had been your password, that would have been more interesting. I can confirm that none of them were my password, <laughs> except for the vulnerable systems that I maintain for that purpose. We need to try it again with me. Try it again with Alex. With my last name. Yeah, as in set the allowed username to be your last Alex name. Alex McKeon, yeah, and see if anyone, if anyone can guess that, I'll be impressed. Suspect that they won't. No, I, I had a, a, a box set up with desktops exposed to the internet for a bit. Um, it was fun. Uh, yeah, a lot of usernames came through, but none of them were right mm. because it was, it was my username that no one ever guesses the things. Also, public key authentication. But yeah, it's interesting to see sort of, I used to help them out on that. And it's, it's fun to look at the logs later. I never thought to actually try and dissect them and see what happened after that. And now we've, it's only spoken from Telscale to that network, so I don't get this. <laughs> yeah, you don't get the barrage. Yeah. yeah. So, more question. Um, I've heard SSH um, agent forwarding allows you to get access to the private keys of the box connecting, like the client connecting. Did you see any evidence of anyone using SSH agent forwarding? No, and I'm just trying to think, you shouldn't be able to get hold of private, I mean, if you intercepted it, you could try and get the private key, but don't forget it will still be encrypted. Because you can be used on, on an agent. You'd be able to pass it through, yeah. Yeah, you'd be able to pass it through, you pass it through its pocket, but the bridge does get access to it. No, it, so if the bridge passes it back to the, it passes back the request to the original box. It's proxying through, you don't, yeah. although the data passes through, so arguably you could look at it, you're not unpacking it. Otherwise, no one would ever use it because <laughs> as soon as you touch something, you end up giving away your private key, which is a really bad idea. I've been in companies where they banned it. Sorry. They've banned public private key uses. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. They banned it, but that's yeah, fair enough. This is this is also a really good reason why by containers you don't put SSH onto those. Yeah. Get into those containers using SSH. As, as, as um, Jonathan said, the first attack after, happened after 11 minutes. You know, most containers are up there for a little bit longer than 11 minutes, so you can <laughs> imagine that some are already trying out your containers. But if you just tear it down every 10 minutes and put a new one up, they'll be fine, right? 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but then if you try to SSH into it yourself, you actually see it the yeah, yeah. Oh, shit, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really quick. You've got to get everything done. But I've seen that in banks where um, they've got long-lived uh, containers and they, they put an SSH agent in there. No, it's not that nice. It's not that nice. worry, it is banks. Any other questions? I know Alex has got a whole pad seemingly full of questions. I do so. not. I had three questions, one of which Glenn answered. Clear <laughs> <laughs> in the talk, so thanks for that. And a really, really stupid question that I'm kind of embarrassed to answer compared to the level of questions mm -hmm. that you've already had. It's just, you mentioned this dash y command yeah which said don't ask me just run yeah why does that exist because so that feels like that's just like giving hackers free reign no, let's bring it back if you're um if you're scripting a system deployment turn the clicker off that's why i don't like if you're scripting a system deployment you don't your, your script isn't going to sit there and say oh yes Oh, okay. So it's just, I, I know I want so there to are legit there. reasons for having that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So I just felt like it was just the hack. It, it'll still only work if you've got the right level of privilege on the oh, system. Oh, okay. Like a Docker container, you will still depend on got the it. Yeah. Yes, mm, okay. So it is literally just. I told you my question is going to be really stupid. Not a sensible question. <laughs>
So yeah, as long as you've got the privilege to run that command, it will do whatever it needs to do, and it will just carry straight through. So. Cool. Thank you. It's all right. The next bit of research I want to do with them is to put a printer on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to use an actual printer, because I like oh. forests, but I will put one up so that it will then capture whatever gets sent to it, and hopefully I can decode it in some way to see what it looks like. Could be awkward, depending on what's going to say. I bet you don't want to see some of the things get sent to that printer. Yeah, that one's definitely being run in Azure, oh. so it's not. I right. have a Dynamo label printer that would destroy the planet slightly less. Would you consider that? What, putting a dynamo label printer on the internet? Yes. <laughs> okay. it could be so you could lay like really tiny labels of really horrific things. I'll just turn up at Code Harbour and just... Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. That yeah. 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 can, be, can be a freebie with the tool. So that, that's my next plan. Um, you never know, there might be another talk on that. Depends if so I'm really bored be. or not. Oh, apparently <laughs> there will be. So there you go. Thank you very much. <laughs>